and read the daily word. The light of the Christ candle reminds us that the divine light burns brightly in all of us and we are all connected as brothers and sisters for we are all one. The daily word for today is prosperity. I am grateful for the many ways prosperity expresses in my life. My prospering thoughts find expression in my life in many ways. I enjoy an abundance of love, peace, health, and happiness, and I pause regularly each day to appreciate my many blessings. The same blessings express whenever I focus my creative thinking on my finances. No matter what my ego mind may insist, I know that I have nothing to fear. I am one with divine mind, and fear has no place in my consciousness. I am guided quickly and easily to choices that will lead to financial prosperity in my life. In quiet moments of meditation throughout the day, I appreciate the ways in which my life is prospered now, and I call upon my gratitude to gently dissolve any sense of lack I may perceive. And from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, the point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And now, uh, please join me in the Lord's Prayer, which is followed by Reverend Aubrey Lynn's meditation and the Sunday talk. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be. Thinking about the Lord's Prayer and the words that we just sang, I invite you to go with me to this beautiful, beautiful garden. filled with the colors of fall.
the magnificent array, trees in the background with gold, red, burgundy, orange. And each place in the garden as you go along, there's a little plaque in the garden. One says, our father. One says, who art in heaven. Another, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Perhaps one of these speaks to you, and there is a bench by each placket. And perhaps along the way, you'd like to stop and just think about the one placard. <coughs> or you'd like to move on. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Move on, on earth as it is in heaven. Or perhaps give us this day our daily bread. In the next one, there's three and four and five benches where it says, forgive us our debtors as we forgive those who trespassed against us. Maybe you want to stay there. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. So as you're walking, if you haven't already stopped, think of a place along this beautiful garden surrounded by the magnificent colors of God. And take a moment to think where I'm sitting now. How does that reflect my life? How does that reflect my spirit? Do I in fact even know truly what this prayer means? So let's just sit with it. And as thoughts, feelings, emotions arise within you, turn and look at all's before you. And just say a prayer of gratitude Thank you, Mother, Father, God. And slowly and peacefully, with love in your heart, when you are ready, come back to this holy, sacred place.
Well, I'd like to dedicate today's um, talk, Metaphysical Meaning Interpretation of the Lord's Prayer, to Sandy Alexander. When we were doing the meet and greet brunches, one of the questions that I asked was, what would you like to hear? What topics would you like me to cover? Uh, and one that Sandy had asked for was the meaning or the metaphysical meaning or interpretation of the Lord's Prayer. And somehow it just finally <laughs> worked into the schedule and uh, I wanted to, so thank you. And it was really interesting doing this because as I, I'm, I worked with it uh, for 10 days and what I found, which was so exciting for me, was I actually could have done a talk on each phrase. I had to keep going back and cutting out because we would have been here for a month of Sundays, and I think that you have some other things that you would like to be doing. But also, when we go into looking deeper into something, there's so many more meanings and ahas that come up. And as I would lie in bed each night, I would start with our father, and I would start rewriting. So each one of us can actually take that one line, our father, and make it into whatever we want it into. And it doesn't dilute the prayer. It makes it work internally for us. So this prayer, as we know, is given to us by Jesus. And it contains some of the most beautiful, inspiring, helpful ideas that we could possibly need. The, re the prayer reminds us of some great truths about ourselves and our relationship with God. And it reminds us of the tremendous, unlimited potential that's within each one of us that we've not yet come to recognize. So contemplating these ideas, then we grow in our spiritual awareness of them so that God's spirit, whatever you choose to call that, which is your creator, can work through you. God in me, as me, is me. And to understand that meaning. So the prayer is a, it's like a compact formula for the development of the soul. And I never looked at it like that before. So thank you, Sandy, for that. So the prayer falls into seven clauses, if you will. And this is characteristic of the Oriental tradition. Symb uh, seven symbolizes individual completeness, the perfection of the individual soul. Now, the eighth clause, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, uh, is not part of the Lord's Prayer. It was added. Now, it is a beautiful affirmation. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. But it was not a part of the original Lord's Prayer. And I believe, and it always bothered me when I went to the Catholic Church with my friends, because they didn't say that line. And I grew up Protestant, and we said that line. So I was like, you forgot part of it. The seven clauses, Jesus, such a master, they were put together in order that they contained everything that we could possibly need to nourish and enrich our soul. This is not just a prayer for us. It is a prayer for all of mankind. So let's begin. Our Father, not an old man in the sky. Okay, so when we, we get that uh, right away uh, from a lot of our bringing up God up in the sky. No, that's not. Our Father represents the creative, creative capacity of God within the individual. And if our Father bothers you, uh, our Creator, because that creative energy is what created us. So it's not a matter, I don't like it because I don't like our Father. Um, I'm not crazy about the father word either, and I, you know, most of you know that I prefer a holy mother, and holy mother is who I, my go-to for prayer, and when um, I, I need that nourishment, I, I want the female aspect of God, and that's totally fine. But these words remind us of the close, intimate relationship that we have with God's spirit, a relationship that which we depend on totally for all that we need. God is our creator, our source of happiness, joy, health, supply, security, or whatever is needed. But many times we turn to that outer world seeking someone or something to fulfill a need within ourselves. But there is nothing, and we know this, 
there is nothing in the outer world that can make us happy. It may make us happy for an instant. You know, we go shopping and we come home with all our bags and we feel great. Or, you know, we redecorate our house and it's all done and we feel great. And then you get the new car and then the new car smell wears off and, well, that was great. And there used to be a song, is that all there is to that? And that's kind of it because when we fill ourselves up with things, sometimes we're crowding that room within us that needs to fill ourselves up with spirit. So God in us is the source of all energy, and that's the creative aspect of everything we expect. My thoughts are prayers. My thoughts are prayers. What are we praying for? Our present human awareness may be limited, but the inner source, God, spirit, intelligence, creative energy, that is never, ever limited. So when we affirm our Father or our Creator, we are acknowledge our oneness with this creative source. That's all we're saying. It's the same thing as the first principle of unity. God is all there is. The first uh, line for religious science prayer treatment is God is all there is. So we're going all the way back two years, and I'm two years, 2,000, you know me in the zeros, 2,000 years or 5,000 years, it's the same thing. What we are acknowledging before we can go forward in our lives is there's one source, one intelligence, one God, whatever you choose to call it with a capital I, is all there is, that infinite intelligence, that wisdom. Our Father in heaven means, according to Charles Fillmore, our Father means that everywhere present inner harmony. Everywhere present there's inner harmony. And we get to choose that inner harmony. Everywhere present inner harmony. Our Father tells us also that we are the children of God. Jesus is not the only begotten son. We are all the begotten sons and daughter of the one creator. Are you with me there? You agree? Children of God, beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. Taurus is agreeing with me. Thank you. Okay. Who art in heaven? So this is not the heaven in the sky. Heaven is a state of consciousness, and metaphysical, uh, metaphysically we believe that. Uh, it's a state of consciousness, and it's a condition of our soul. When we are in tune with the creator and in harmony with the universe, we're in heaven. How many times do you just go, this is heaven. You know, I walked outside this morning and it wasn't freezing. I went, this is heaven. <laughs> you know, this is heaven because we're in tune with that which is of the nature and nature, of course, is God. So when we're out of tune, we're not living spiritual principles. And this is what we call hell. So both can be heaven and or hell by merely a state of our consciousness. When I was little and you know it was the the, the jesus thing and and all of, of the uh, things that were against us if we did bad things i used to have well i have the jesus on this shoulder and that was heaven i have the devil on this shoulder and that was hell and then you were like a kid you're going okay which way do i go i know this is the right way but i want to go that way but that's hell well no S but that still was a state of consciousness even though i didn't know it then because it's what you're thinking is your state of consciousness so we have to recognize that the light within us, that it may create within us the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is within. God is within. You know, more and more as I was delving into this, so many philosophers and teachers and, you know, the Fillmore's and Dr. Holmes and Emmett Fox and so many other people that I were reading in the past 10 days, all were bringing it to the one soul within. And then, no, we are the soul. We are soul, and we are in the body. So the body is the spacesuit that we walk around with that houses the soul. So isn't that awesome? God's soul heart is all within us right here, right now. And with that comes a little bit of a responsibility, too. So which art in heaven? So which art in heaven is then God is omniscient, all-knowing, all-wise. Agree, right? Yes, okay. Omnipotent, the ultimate power, all-powerful. 
omnipresent, with and around and all, everywhere present, which, which art in heaven, which art within the heart and soul of who we are. So our creator, we're all one with that creator, which art in heaven, which lives within our own hearts and soul. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed means holy. In the Bible, as elsewhere, the name of anything means the essential nature or character. So when it says thy name, holy be thy name, what it is saying then is Holy be the nature of that which is. And if that which is is holy and God is holy, then the, and we're made of the image and likeness of God, then therefore holy is the essential nature of who we are. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So holy, hallow, <laughs> hallowed of uh, being holy, name being the essential of who and what we are, if God is that, then we are too. And uh, holy also, come, going back to Old English, it means whole, wholesome, heal, and healed. So the character of God is whole and healing. The essence of God is the nature or character. We are made in the image and likeness. Therefore, we are whole, holy, and healed. God is all there is lives within us, and the name is holy. Makes a whole difference when, when you start to sing this every week. Now, it's going to give it a, a different, I, I hope it's going to give you a, a different feel for this song. So all-powerful is thy nature. So in the, in the face, then, of trying experiences uh, and life circumstances, and we all have them, we learn to stand firm and face what needs to be faced instead of running from it. And sometimes when you have to run face to face to something, it is very uncomfortable. Very, very uncomfortable. And it also, sometimes we say, well, let's just go around it or let's go over it. And sometimes that can be the answer, but sometimes you have to go through it. And when we align ourselves then with its nature, it responds to us. My thoughts are prayers. I'm always praying. What we're putting out is coming back to us all the time. So thy will be done. Oh, no, we're not there yet. We skipped a page. Hold on. Okay. The kingdom come. The kingdom come. So now many Christians are still waiting and believe that Jesus is coming back to set up the kingdom. The, this part that... Thy, thy kingdom, the, the part that the thys are not understanding is Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So Jesus coming back is not coming back to walk on the face of the earth and do all of those things that it said as well, because Jesus is already here. Jesus is already here. It's the Christ consciousness. It's not Jesus and his last name is Christ. It's Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Christ consciousness. And that is here right now with us already. You have to understand that the kingdom is the dawning of consciousness of the inner presence of God. Thy kingdom come. It dawns on us all of a sudden oh my God, I actually am beginning to believe this. Some people go, I, I just can't say that yet. I'm not, and that's okay. But all of a sudden, it begins to dawn on you. Thy kingdom come. And when the kingdom comes within yourself, it's kind of a sad day for the ego, but it's a joyous day for the soul. Because, and not that ego's bad, because ego is not bad. It is our driving force. But ego running our life, it's not good. It's not good then. So when, so when this all happens, then it says in the Bible that, you know, then the blind will see. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's miraculous, all these blind people, and all of a sudden they see. The blind will see means we open our eyes and begin to understand. And the deaf will hear. We hear. We hear what's going on inside. So the inner blindness to all that is good will be seen. 
Sometimes we walk around blind. Sometimes I walk around blind. But we have to see with God's eyes and we have to hear with God's ears. And then the truths of God's inner voice will come forward. When the real kingdom is consciousness is revealed, it will be a glorious and uh, powerful experience. It will. And it happens in bits and pieces. And just take those and remember them as you go through your days. And when something's going a little this way, go just pull back that, ah, that feeling. Yes, I have this within me, this which will guide me. So thy will be done then on earth as it is in heaven. This is a hard one to understand because we think, well, that's God's will and I have no choice. Uh-uh, wrong, uh-uh. This is a hard one because only good is God's will. Only good and nothing but good. And then you go, but what about the tragedies? Everybody goes, what about the tragedies? God does not create tragedies. Our lives, not ours, our lives are what creates tragedies. And about that, is there a soul agreement? I don't know. Do I think perhaps there is one? Maybe. Are we all expressing as God in different levels of our consciousness? I believe yes. Am I going to tell the mother that just lost four daughters that, you know, that's not the will of God? And am I going to tell her that, you know, maybe that was a soul agreement? Of course not. But what I know is that there's a purpose to why we come, why we're here, and when we leave. And that's all I know because the wisest man alive hasn't come back to tell us anything different so far. So when we set aside our goals and plans and accept that God, God wants more for us than we ever could imagine for ourselves. Absolutely. You know, it, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. How much of it are you ready to take? Do you come with, you know, please, sir, can I have some more? Or do you come with, please, sir, can I have some more? What do you come with? What is your begging bowl? You know, maybe it should say instead of, you know, thy will be done, thy good be done. Thy good be done on earth. Earth means our physical senses, the five senses. And as it is in heaven, of course, is the kingdom within our six senses. So... We are moving to a higher consciousness, and I, I know there's a song that we sing, Seek to Our Highest Consciousness. And in affirmative prayer, we bring heaven, that which is the spirit, to earth, heaven to earth. We bring that which is inside of us out. We have to deal with the inner before we can go with the outer. So give us this day our daily bread. Jesus was not referring simply to food. He was referring to uh, prayer, meditation, journaling. Give us this day our daily food. Give us that which supports us on our spiritual journey. Our daily bread is where we go to, to that place that is quiet, to that silent place. Give us this time. When you wake up in the morning and you say, thank you, God, for this day, that's your daily bread. And our daily bread is of inspiration. Daily bread is spiritual ideas, guidance, wisdom that we receive directly, directly from the inner voice within. And this part, give us this day our daily bread, it moves us from begging and beseeching to faith and expectation. So the key to remember then about our daily bread is our only source and supply is God. That's it. That's our only source and supply. So yes, all, and when we think about it, we think about how all nature is supplied and how every insect and, and worm and bird and animal are supply, supplied with food and how they know when to go. They don't wake up and say, well, I wonder if God's going to give me my daily bread today. They instinctively know. And we instinctively know when we start our day going within instead of without, then we too come to that place of 
peace and loving and understanding. God will source and supply. It's not your job. It's not your paycheck. It's God. So forgive us our debts since we forgive our debtors. This is the tricky one, very tricky, because before our minds can be free, you have to have freedom, and to have freedom, you must hold nothing against ourselves or anyone else. You cannot, until you forgive yourself, you cannot forgive someone else. You may think you do, but you're still harboring something. And we have to be at peace with our brothers and sisters. And it's simple, and it's difficult. Laura Berman is a great metaphysical singer, and she has a song. Um, it's called, I think it's Time for the Letting Go, and it's, oh, it's such a great, passionate song. And in that, she's taking total responsibility for her life, and she talks about letting go of the pills and the drink and, and all of the things, and I think it's time for the letting go, and she's letting go of all the, the blame and the guilt, and, and it's powerful, and it builds, and I think it's time for the letting go. And she is a metaphysical teacher, and she, this song is uh, quite, oh, uh, it's probably 20 years old, and I have done some workshops with her, and the passion of accepting the oneness of who and what you are with our creator, and the willingness to let go of all of that stuff, and you know, when you're letting go of drugs and alcohol and whatever your addiction may be, it's not easy. So forgiving ourselves and letting go is more important. The debts are not financial. It's not forgive us our debtors like people who owe us money, although they might. It's spiritual. What we're letting go is of, of guilt and shame and uh, blame. And the list goes on and on. And we want to break ourselves free from that. We free ourselves from the false illusions and see the beauty and perfection of who and what we are. Forgiveness is paramount for spiritual growth. And in our humanness, God holds nothing against us. So why are we holding things against ourselves and others? If God holds nothing against us, who are we to hold something against ourselves? If I'm a loving child of God, if, if you're a loving child of God, God holds nothing against us. Hold us not. So I want to s tell you that in um, Emmett Fox's book on forgiveness, he says that we can't go forward with this prayer or that we can't say it anymore until we are forgiveness. And this kind of just blew me away a little bit. He says that, that the entire prayer has been arranged, that it covers going from the unfoldment of the soul to, to, the, uh, to, to the part where evil is just lack of love. So he's talking about temptation and the temptations of the soul, and he's not again talking about the good or bad things, but he's talking about complacency. And complacency can make us arrogant. And he's talking about selfishness. And he's talking about greed. But what he says about, I couldn't even condense it because it's just a paragraph. And I want to read to you. He says, never do this prayer again unless you forgive him. Now, that's a big, tall order. This is just Emmett Fox. I mean, but I want to read this to you. Because he says, as we repeat the great prayer intelligently, Considering and meaning what we say, we are suddenly so, uh, so to speak, caught off our feet and grasped as, as though we're in a vice. So that we must face this problem and there is no escape. We must positively and de define, definitely extend forgiveness to everyone to whom it is possible that we have injured in any way or have injured us. Jesus leaves no room, he says, for any possible glossing over of this fundamental thing. Wow. He has to contrive it that once our attention has been drawn to this matter, that which is bothering you, my words, um, 
then we, it's either we're obliged to either forgive our enemies in sincerity and truth or never again repeat the prayer. Oh, my God. You know, I read that, and I sat with that, and I read that, and I sat with that. He says it's safe to say that no one who reads this essay will under, with understanding will ever again be able to use the Lord's Prayer unless and until he has forgiven. Should you now attempt to repeat it without forgiving, it can safely be predicted that you will not be able to finish it. The great central clause will stick in your throat. Wow. You know, I was talking to Vita this morning about this, and I was saying that all of this week I was going through my life in people and, you know, the, the childhood and all of that stuff and the Me Too stuff and all of that stuff and going through uh, my, my marriage and my relationship with my daughter and my relationship with my families and the stuff that went on in the corporate world and all week, all of this was rolling and rolling and rolling. And I could honestly say that I don't hold anything against anyone anymore. And it was something that was crushing, something that brought tears, something that was like, and then I had to say, but what about you? What are you still holding against you? And then I understood this prayer. Because what Jesus did with this prayer, he set up everything about your relationship with God. And then he said, okay, now you have all that. You have all this goodness. You have this inner understanding going on in your life. Now you must face this. And that's a big wow. We have kids that don't talk to parents and sisters who don't talk to brothers and so on and so forth and uh, people who cheated you out of money and people who betrayed you. And we have all of this that's within us. And somehow, Jesus says forgive. 70 times 70, he says forgive. So we want to be delivered then. We want to be delivered from ignorance, greed, selfishness, gossip, racism, hate. Deliver us from evil. That's the evil. It doesn't mean about right or wrong, good or bad. Deliver us from that kind of stuff. And any separation that from love is evil, bring us back together. Evil is that which is created out of man. It's a state of consciousness that separates from the Christ love of our source. So no matter what the temptation, desire, or evil might be, it transcends when we surrender to the power of the Christ love. So thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, and thine is the glory forever. And this is what I know. I know that all life is God, and I know that all power is God, and seemingly outer, other power is an illusion of the mind. The great master teacher stated, I of my own self can do nothing, and neither can we. So I found another interpretation. Do you know how many interpretations of the Lord's Prayer there are. So what I would like to do this morning is I like to read the, the Lord's Prayer part, and then I would like you guys to recite the next thing. So are we on the right thing? No, we're not. That was not supposed to be going at all till the end. <laughs> okay. Okay, can we go back? We're back? Okay, so our Father who art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so it is. And so ends the lesson and so begins a very, very special, precious moment.